we all right want to call the january 6th uh, meeting of the sayo township environmental sustainability task force to order and it's about 703 and um our first order of business is the adoption of the agenda and i do want to let people know um that there is a change in our speaker uh tim Tim Redmond's going to introduce our speakers. And then we have, um, and is, I don't know, is it Jay's, what Jay's last name is, Tim? Yeah, Jay Gerhardt. Gerhardt, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, Jay Gerhardt will be um, talking about uh, supporting local food and sustainable agriculture this evening. All right, um, so if I could uh, just have the, um, agenda moved with with that adjustment. And if there are any other adjustments to the uh, agenda, please speak up now. So moved as presented. Okay. Second. Okay, so it's moved by Charlie Nielsen and supported by Bob Lloyd, uh, that we adopt the agenda as amended. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Great, any opposed? All right, we'll move forward with that. Um, communications and correspondence. Um, I'd like to talk about two items. Um, let's see, uh, uh, Jackie, do you want to uh, talk about our communication from C's? Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> we had floated a proposal for a uh, CS that is the School of Environment and Sustainability Masters project, and we went through the selection process, and were informed shortly before the holidays that we did in fact attract a student team um, of five master students, and they will be working with um, Professor Raymond De Young, who does. Um, environmental behavior is his specialty. And the proposal that we had put together outlined a role for the students in supporting us um, on community engagement, outreach, and education. Um, so I think as, as time goes on, we'd really like to invite the students to start attending our meetings. I am, we're debating whether to introduce them next meeting or the March meeting because they still need to get up and running on their end. Um, but as time goes by, they will be uh, work, attending our meetings, attending working groups, um, and, and then working with us to, to, to figure out, they might be a little bit too late getting started to really engage with us on getting community involved in developing our work but certainly there um, hopefully will be ramped up by the summer and fall to really work with us on getting community participation and involvement in, in putting this plan out there into the world and um, coming up with educational materials and so on. Yeah, so that's great. That And a team of five is awesome. That's a really good team. So that, yay. Thank you, um, Jackie, for um, coordinating that. That's on. It's awesome. Um, the other thing is I had a um, brief meeting with um, Matt Nod, and he is one of the folks um, leading what's going to be a Resilient Washtenaw, and that is the um, county effort, um, uh, Washtenaw County's Climate Action Plan effort. And uh, we talked about kind of a little bit about what the task force was doing and um, He's uh, very interested and, in, you know, asked if the um, environmental task force would be interested in hosting um, maybe a couple of um, public meetings. Um, it would be targeted at the districts, um, the county commission districts, and we have um, residents in both one and nine, I believe. And so I wanted to just, uh, we can, um, you know, just see if uh, the task force would be interested in doing um, doing that. We'd have to, we'd probably do it outside of our regular meeting and we'd be coordinating with Matt Nod, um, Andrew Delu at the county is gonna be the face and then EcoWorks is in charge of um, 
their public engagement strategies. So we would have plenty of support and leadership. We would have to, our responsibility would be, um, you know, to work with them in planning the meetings and doing some outreach, making sure we get folks. Um, they are planning on doing them all virtual. So it would be getting the word out and um, uh, getting a good turnout um, for those meetings. It's also an opportunity for us to share a little bit of what you know we've been doing. So um, uh, I, I guess uh, I think um, I'd be interested in the task force's response to that, and maybe we can do that. Um, you know, when we're doing our discussion with the report framework, so we don't keep our speakers here longer than they need to be. Um, any other communication or correspondence that folks are aware of? All right, then I will turn it over to Tim and uh, you can uh, announce our speakers and introduce them this evening. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> you all can't tell, but I'm in Florida as I talk right now. And I'll be rejoining y'all in Michigan in about a week and a half, but uh, nice, been nice to be down here. My job is to introduce Barry Lonick and Jay Gerhardt to you tonight, and, um, and I'm happy to do so. I'm, I'm honored as well. Both Jay and Barry have been uh, working hard in our county and in our township, particularly Barry. Um, <clears throat> to uh, to make our our space healthy and um, strong for the future, resilient, and uh, they have worked fairly tires tirelessly doing what they do, and um, and I respect them both a great deal. Barry is going to talk on open land conservation and uh, how that is relevant to um, making our township healthy and beautiful for the future. Historically, um, Barry is one of the uh, Michigan, I think, Barry, you're one of Michigan's longest standing, um, still standing person working on land preservation. Barry was one of the founders of the original Washtenaw Land Conservancy, which Later on became the Legacy Land Conservancy, which you're probably all familiar with. Barry uh, works now for several of the county's townships, um, including Sio Township, and he is the main advisor or consultant for, <clears throat> for Sio Township's Land Preservation Commission, which I'm a part of, along with Jackie Corto and others. And I think Jackie, you're on this call. We all in the uh, LPC, the Land Preservation Commission, have a lot of respect and appreciation for the work that uh, Barry has done over the past decade or so. He, Barry probably knows more about open land in our county than um, in our in our county and in our township than anyone else, at least anyone else I know. And his work has been highly, I was going to say extremely, I don't think that's a good word, but highly effective over the decade, decades of his work. <clears throat> By the numbers, Barry has marked 30 years now in local land conservation. By uh, this year, and he's protected 114 properties, representing over 8,000 acres. And, He's attracted in doing so in getting that done. He's attracted over $40 million in matching funds from you know, both the county, from the state, and from the federal government, as well as uh, Legacy Land Conservancy and, and other local groups. So Jay's gonna, I, I mean, Barry's gonna talk to you about that. And uh, Jay, I know from the uh, Washington Food Policy Council and the work that um, I've been doing for years with her as uh, part of the Farmer Policy Action Team within the local uh, Washington Food Policy Council. She has um, been working on food system work in the county in particular as an MSU extension person 
whose job it is to uh, um, further local agriculture in our county. Um, she's been a farmer herself and she currently lives out on near Manchester. And I think Jay, you're working on a, you're living on a small farm out there. You can correct me if that's wrong. Technically, but the baby made my farming not very strong last year. <laughs> so uh, her job as the local foods coordinator for MSU Extension is to work with smaller multi-crop farmers and helping uh, local farmers prop, prosper and succeed. So um, she's also working on our area's land link effort, which is an effort to to link beginning farmers to land as it becomes available in a form and price that's affordable to local farmers. And that could be in a number of different forms, but it's relevant to our work in the, in the uh, Land Preservation Commission because we may, as we, uh, uh, as we protect pieces of land in the future, we may be able to offer them to local farmers at a, at a workable farmer price for land. So uh, without further ado, Barry, why don't you um, tell us what you know? Uh, hey, we'll do that, Tim. Thanks for the introduction and hello everybody. Um, in addition to Tim and Jacqueline being current members of the Land Preservation Commission, Jane Vogel and Margaret Engel are former members of the LPC, so uh, quite well represented here this evening. There are a total of nine publicly funded land preservation programs in the state of Michigan, where voters have had the opportunity <clears throat> to, uh, to, to cast a vote on whether they were willing to tax themselves to fund a land preservation program. So nine programs in the state of Michigan. Six of them are in Washtenaw County. That's four townships, plus Washtenaw County and the city of Ann Arbor Greenbelt program. So we're quite unique here in that um, we have a, a, a ready and continuing source of, of funding available um, for land preservation projects here. And that was something that I recognized oh, probably 25 years ago um, where you know, we had intense development pressure. Um, we had pretty high values for properties. Um, and as the executive director of, of what is now Legacy Land Conservancy, it just became clear that we, we weren't gonna succeed in, in conserving land around here with private donations. It's just too hard to raise that kind of money. Um, we don't have sand dunes. We don't have Lake Michigan frontage. We don't have old growth forests for the most part. We have some beautiful natural features in this county, um, but they're not as spectacular um, as other places around Michigan. Um, where those kinds of private dollars and foundation dollars are much more likely to be uh, directed. And so that's when I started advocating that we go on the ballot um, and ask voters if they're willing to, con uh, to contribute funds through a tax. And uh, over the years, the, there's been overwhelming support from all of those six programs and some of them, including SIO's program, have been uh, renewed. Um, so there's been quite a few votes uh, cast um, in Washtenaw County in support of, of these programs. So SIO's program was the first approved by voters in 2004, uh, so just over 17 years ago. Um, it was originally for 10 years, um, and then it was renewed uh, a few years ago. So we're in the second 10-year period now as we speak, um, which runs through 2024. Um, but the LPC has made a recommendation to the Board of Trustees um, to place a renewal of uh, the millage on the ballot this coming November for a, a third 10 years. And uh, we hope that the, uh, the trustees will agree to do that and then we will run a campaign and uh, chances are we'll have good success again. I think that the first time we ran, it was 73% support and the second time was 70% support. So both times you know, by huge margins, the voters in SIO um, understood that uh, in order to conserve our open spaces, you need to put money on the table to compete with developers. Uh, so the, the tax is a half a mil. Um, and uh, the last year that I had uh, data for, 
uh, readily available anyway, um, was through the, the uh, fiscal year of 2020, which ended uh, almost two years ago now. And in that year, the millage generated $620,000. And that's been about the average over the, the 17 years or so. It's, it's gone up and gone down with the recession and um, with uh, uh, Dexter becoming a city and no longer part of the township. So that was no longer contributing to the tax base and so forth. But it's about $600,000 a year um, for that time period. Uh, a program is directed by the Land Preservation Commission, a seven member body that is appointed by the Board of Trustees um, and it's staffed by me. Uh, so far we have conserved 1,585 acres and I'm actually gonna throw one, uh, as, we were, as you were doing the intros, Jan, I, I thought I gotta dig out a couple of uh, slides here to show everybody. Um, so let's see, where are we here? Hang on a second there. That's not the one I wanted to do. That's the one I wanted to do. We're, we're losing you a little, Barry. Can you now see that uh, the, the uh, protected yeah. lands? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to reduce it just a little bit here so you can see the whole township. So the township, if you don't know, is bordered by Joy Road on the north side, Parker Road on the west side. Maple Road on the east and Sino Church Road on the south. <coughs> this map uh, shows you where all of the conserved places are in the township, which includes places that are not ones that were conserved by the township millage. So Saginaw Forest, the U of M property, the Metro Parks, a um, couple of Ann Arbor City Parks are included in there. But that's, uh, and but then all the ones that have uh, the hatching on it, the cross hatching are ones that have been conserved uh, by virtue of the, the township's millage. This is on the township's website also, by the way. So um, you, can, you can track this down. And I think actually I uh, uh, got one more update to do on this. Uh, we just closed something in, in the fall that hasn't been added to that yet. So as I said, 1,585 acres conserved uh, with funds from the township's millage, about 46% of that land area um, is in natural features, woods, wetlands, streams. 42% um, is in agricultural use actively. And about 11% is non-agricultural open space, old fields and those kinds of things. Uh, there are uh, a couple of preserves that have been acquired uh, with township funds. A couple of those are owned by Washtenaw County Parks and managed by them. Uh, those are the Sio Church Woods over on uh, Sio, uh, Sio Church Road, um, which is a, a gorgeous 100 plus acre um, mature forest with streams and wetlands. If you haven't been there, it's a fantastic place to go. Um, so we contributed funds toward that one and also for the Fox Science Preserve um, over on Peters Road. Um, I forget how many acres that is, that's well over 100 acres also. Um, there's a couple of other county preserves in, in the township as well, um, but those were purchased before the township's millage came into place. So the county has a couple of preserves around, but the township has also bought properties um, as preserves, um, four of them so far. Uh, there's a little park at the corner of Dexter and Arbor Road and Z Road, um, right north of the township hall, right there toward the intersection. That's letter K on here. Um, we're calling that Marshall Park as frontage and access from Marshall Road. Uh, there is the Sloan Preserve over on the west side. That's letter I over here, um, which is on Baker Road and uh, has frontage on Mill Creek, which from uh, Parker Road to Shield Road is a state natural river. It's part of the Huron River's designation. Um, and the Huron, of course, is also a, a state natural river as it runs through the township. But that section of Mill Creek is also a state natural river, so we have frontage on that um, through the Sloan Preserve. Uh, we have over here on the north side, letter L, is the Van Curler Preserve, um, which is also about 100 acres. Um, has, has frontage on both Joy and Huron River Drive, but no access just yet. Um, we're under contract to buy an adjacent parcel um, so we can put in a little parking area and a trailhead and get into that really beautiful um, wooded preserve there. 
And then the fourth preserve that has been purchased with township funds and is owned and managed by the township um, is this group over here uh, around letter K um, that doesn't have a name formally yet. Um, it's a group of a bunch of different properties that we've purchased over a number of years. Um, and so we just call it the West Sile Preserve for the time being. Um, and that's a beautiful um, upland and uh, lowland woods uh, with the branch of Honey Creek uh, going through it. Uh, mature woods, again, uh, lots of great wildlife out there and trails on that one. So Sloan and Van Curl, I'm sorry, Van Sloan and West Sio um, have uh, trails on them at this point. When we acquire the, the Van Curler addition, uh, we'll, we'll have trails going through there as well. So those are the preserves that have been acquired with township millage funds. In addition to that, most of the work that we do is in what we call conservation easements, um, where we're not buying the property. We are buying just the right that landowners have to develop their property, what people commonly call the development rights, which is division into smaller parcels, construction of houses, making a gravel pit, clear cutting the woods, draining wetlands, all those kinds of things that one can do to develop a property. We buy those rights. And we buy that through a deed restriction that's called a conservation easement. And uh, uh, the easement identifies uh, uh, the reasons that we're doing uh, the easement, uh, identifies the rights that are being conveyed, also the ones that are being retained. Um, so it's still privately owned property. Um, and the, uh, uh, the owner can still restrict public access to it. Most people want to do that, although we have several easement properties in Sile where um, the public is actually welcome to come on the property. That's uh, very unusual. But for the most part, uh, public access is restricted. They still have other use of the property for agriculture, hunting, um, uh, uh, other kinds of activities like that that don't disturb the conservation values of the property. Um, but the, the right to basically uh, uh, divide the property into smaller parcels and build houses has been conveyed and that's a perpetual restriction on the use of the property. No matter who owns the property going forward, they have to abide by that agreement that was reached between the township and the original owner, grantor of the easement. And we've had several properties that have changed hands over the years. Um, and so I make sure that those people know that there's an easement on that property and they can't do a whole bunch of things. So that's what conservation easements are in a nutshell. Um, and we've done a bunch of those projects there um, on the right side of the map here. You can see all the easement properties that they're pink looks like. Um, so when you see pink um, around the, the township, um, those are ones that uh, uh, we've conserved um, with easements using township funds. Uh, so the total amount of conserved land in the township, this is one of, of Celeste's questions. Um, is about 2,800 acres. And there's a total of about 22,000 acres in Silo Township. And that's excluding the city of Dexter, which is its own entity, um, and the city of Ann Arbor. Um, so it's a little bit less than a full 36 section town, Michigan Township. But 22,000 acres total, uh, 2,800 conserved, which is about 13% of the total land area um, in the township. I don't know what the percentages of, of, of what's been developed, but it's probably more than that. And that's a figure that's out there, but I don't know that off the top of my head. So the way the program works is that uh, a landowner submits an application to the program. We run it through a scoring system um, that has been established since day one um, with the program. Um, and then uh, depending on how it comes out, uh, we rank them um, along with the, all the other properties that have been uh, nominated and uh, decide which ones we wanna pursue. Um, if it's something that looks attractive, then one of my jobs as the staff person is to go out and look for other funding sources to match our, uh, our millage. As I said, we generate about $600,000 a year, which is great, um, but when you know, land and development rights cost 10 or $12,000 an acre, um, doesn't go as far as you want it to. It's not endless. Um, and so uh, we've had great uh, success in attracting funding sources from a variety of locations. 
the city of Ann Arbor's Greenbelt program applies to about two thirds of, of Sio Township heading to the west. It's one mile west of Zeeb Road um, is the Greenbelt boundary. So they've been a great partner for us. Uh, the Washtenaw County Parks Natural Area Preservation Program, which is now in its third 10 years, um, has been a good partner for us, both for the preserves that they've purchased, but also in contributing to our the purchase of, of silos preserves and silo conservation easements. Uh, we've had great success with a, a federal grant program that's now called the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program um, over the years. And, uh, and we've also got uh, some money from a relatively a new state of Michigan program for farmland easements as well. Um, so um, we're uh, at about one and a half dollars of, of outside funds for every dollar that we're contributing. Um, so we're taking that $600,000 and turning it into a million and a half dollars on an annual basis. And now we can do some projects with that. Um, so one of the, the next thing that we do once we decide that we're going to uh, pursue a project, if we're going to be a purchase, we draft the deed. Um, if we are going to do an easement, we draft the conservation easement document, which is like 25 pages long. And then we also conduct uh, what we call due diligence on the property. We have a survey done of the area that's going to be conserved. Uh, we have hired a firm to do an environmental assessment to make sure there aren't any dumps or uh, reports of spills on the property going forward. Uh, we have an appraisal done by an independent person that uh, tells us what the value of the land is or the conservation easement. Um, and, uh, and the way the easement works, by the way, is that the appraiser says, um, here's the value of the property if, if it could be sold for development purposes today, let's call it 10,000 an acre. And uh, if it was restricted to uh, agricultural use, um, and could not be divided and built on. It's worth 3,500 bucks an acre. And then the development rights are worth the difference of 6,500 bucks an acre. So that's what we're paying people to uh, convey the right to develop their property in perpetuity. So that's uh, part of our due diligence. Uh, we also uh, have legal review of all of the, um, the documents that have to be uh, produced for all of this. Uh, if it's a conservation easement, one of the things that I do is a what's called a baseline documentation report that um, uh, defines what the condition of the property is at the time that the uh, easement is being conveyed. So uh, aerial photographs, uh, topographic maps, descriptions of soils, photographs from the ground, that all goes into a big folder. We agree this is what the property looks like. And so when we do an annual monitoring visit to make sure that the, that the agreement terms are being upheld in perpetuity, that there haven't been any changes that the easement didn't authorize. So that's all of our due diligence. Eventually we get to the title company and uh, we sign documents, we hand over a check and we go from there. That's how the whole process works. I wanted to show you a second document here. Uh, this one here. Um, one of uh, Celeste's questions was about um, how do we select properties? Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, we've done a couple of times at the LPC um, is uh, they tasked me with looking at every uh, undeveloped property or properties that had you know, significant uh, natural resources of one kind or another on them. And, uh, and then we, uh, and it's about, I think we started that there's about there was like 110 or something of that nature now we're down to about 90 because we've conserved a whole bunch of them um but nevertheless um we've i uh, uh prioritized them by high medium and low priority um based on a number of criteria that that are in the the uh, ordinance and the scoring system um but also just some opinion of mine as well so this shows you um where all the conserved properties are in the, looks like green there. And then in the red um, is the high priority properties. And I, I, I meant to look this up earlier. I think that represents you know, three or 4,000 acres just in the high priority ones. Um, and there's some mediums and, and some lows as well. Um, so one of the questions was, you know, you know, what's enough or you know, how much is out there still? Um, there's still a, a bunch of really great properties to conserve for their open space values, for agricultural potential, and for natural features. 
Um, so I think we're still, um, we got a lot to do. And that's why we're, the LPC has recommended uh, a renewal of the millage for another 10 years. Um, I wanted to take a couple of minutes uh, and talk about one of the new initiatives of the, the LPC, um, because this also pertains, I think, very much uh, to your considerations as this committee. Um, we had a rid of the property and did conservation easement. They wanted to just sell the property, and be done with it, want to get their money and, and be done. Um, and so, uh, since and, and I've seen a number of other opportunities like this, um, so we've actually uh, developed a policy. Um, that has been presented to the Board of Trustees and is on the agenda next Tuesday for approval. Um, and it's under the heading of buy, protect, sell. So most of the deals that we've done are ones where we either buy them, like the preserves, or we're buying conservation easements on properties. And it's in private ownership. We never enter into the ownership chain for those easement deals. For a couple of examples now, as I said, um, the, that uh, those ways were not possible. The first one that happened um, is the one here in the, the northwest corner of Zeeb and Sio Church Road. Um, it's called, it's, it was the April farm um, and had been in the family for at least 150 years. And uh, Mr. April passed away. Um, I had talked to him for years and he always said, I'm letting my kids decide what to do. And through a couple of incredible strokes of luck, uh, found out that uh, the property was available um, and they got an offer from a developer. We swooped in and bought the property from them. It's an entirely agricultural property. There's a couple of little wetland spots and about 20 trees and the rest of it's giant agricultural fields with amazing scenic views. Um, and really good quality agricultural soils and an historic house and an historic barn. And it was just, you know, and, and uh, uh, kudos to the township board at the time, this was a couple of years ago, um, that they said, we understand this is too important. We'll authorize the funds to buy the farm and then we'll figure out what to do with it later. It was not uh, a, nat you know, a natural area like the preserves where the township wanted to own the property long term and lease it out. They just, you know, but the only thing we had we had to do in the short term was to buy the property. Um, we've since sold that property uh, subject to some uh, other agreements um, to the folks who run Tantre Organic Farm um, through another extremely uh, amazing stroke of luck. Um, and so uh, we sold the farm to Tantre uh, with uh, mortgages that are held by the township. The township is the bank. And also purchase agreements for them to sell conservation easements when the funds for, that, for those purchases have been assembled, which we've now done with federal uh, green belt and township funds. Uh, so they will take the proceeds from selling the conservation easements to pay off the mortgages. So that's a buy, protect, sell deal, one way of, of going about doing it. So, uh, and we're scheduled to close the first of the two easements on that, two 80 acre pieces basically, um, next Friday, if all goes well. Um, and then the, the second one shortly thereafter. And so they will own that property free and clear of, of any liens or encumbrances like mortgages, um, but subject to the conservation easements. And I know some people probably have been out there um, this past year. Um, they planted strawberries and raspberries and blackberries. And you can go out and pick strawberries and raspberries now. Um, they've had uh, squash out there. They planted a bunch of fruit and nut trees. I mean, they're really going for it and, and doing a terrific uh, regenerative agriculture um, and food producing um, uh, project out there. And, and some of the lands uh, remaining uh, uh, idle um, to start building soil health. Once again, it was you know in conventional agriculture for a long time and got beat up pretty bad. So um, that's a great success story for us. Um, the one that we've got in progress right now is over here on the east side. Um, this is the Wrens farm. Um, it's 110 acres total on the west side of Wagner, just south of Liberty. Uh, same deal, Mr. Wrens passed away at 90 some years of age. And the heir said, we're willing to sell this property to you. 
And so we've entered into a, a, another unique, different arrangement for this one, um, where we're buying a conservation easement. Um, right now we're under contract to buy the land after the easement as well, but that right is gonna be transferred to a national group called American Farmland Trust in the short term, while we enter into, for the first time, uh, a process for um, uh, making it known through a, requ a request for proposals that this land is available. And it's about hundred acres uh, that will be under the easement. The township is buying about 10 acres on the north side of it for a future fire station and a water storage tank. So the easement is gonna cover 101 acres. Um, and uh, we're letting people know, um, hopefully by the middle of this month, um, that this land is available and we're accepting proposals. Um, and we have a set of criteria uh, by which uh, we will be evaluating those proposals. Jay and I have a conversation tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. to talk about uh, collaborating on this. Um, and uh, so we're going to let it know. We're going to have a 60-day window and people can say, here's my proposal for buying this uh, 101 acres um, and uh, keeping it in some sort of agricultural use. Um, we're not specifying that, although we're putting a, an emphasis on um, uh, uh, agriculture that's going to produce food for human consumption as opposed to, you know, corn and soybeans that are being shipped off to Chicago and Kansas. Um, so we'll see what we get. I've already had a number of inquiries about that, um, and I expect that we'll have quite a few more once that becomes uh, uh, public, um, that uh, this land's available. Um, okay, and you so, want to say what the price will be on that? So, yeah, um, so the uh, the value of the land after the easements in place for 101 acres is $280,000. So 2,800 bucks an acre, basically, which is a damn good price. It does have a house on it. Um, it was inhabited before, uh, you know, up until Mr. Renz passed away. It's not in the greatest shape, um, uh, but it put, could potentially be fixed up. Um, if it's not habitable, it needs lots of work. Um, then we allow that to be raised and a new house to be built within a three acre building envelope in the vicinity of the existing house. There's a couple of uh, buildings on there, but they're not really usable for anything either. Um, so we allow other agricultural buildings to be constructed within that, that three acre building envelope as well. The township uh, has the option also of charging a, an administrative fee for running through this. I think it's 10% it's of the sale price. So it's something around $300,000 will be the ultimate purchase price for 100 acres, three quarters of a mile west of the Ann Arbor city limits with really good agricultural soils, a couple of chunks of woods um, and terrific scenic views once again. And the, the price itself is, is you know, extremely attractive to any, any farm uh, venture that wants to consider a piece of property that size. It's, uh, it makes it possible for new farmers to come in and acquire a piece of land and get going. I'm anticipating that we will have no shortage of good applications, yeah. good proposals that come in. And we'll have a, I think we'll have a difficult time uh, making a selection on this. We don't have the opportunity to divide this property into smaller parcels, um, which is possible to do in a conservation easement. You just have to specify that can be done in the easement document. Typically there are no divisions you can specify that divisions can be done. It's just, this deal is so complicated already. We just haven't had to go there on this one, but that's something we may do in the future to look at hundred acres and say, okay, let's make it into three, you know, 35 acre farms more or less and allow for one house to be built on, on every one of them. That's a future consideration, but we have had that conversation. I wanna to touch on one, one other quick thing and then I'll open up for questions from there. Um, uh, and that is the, the, the township just recently purchased three more parcels um, to add onto the West Sile Preserve. And going back to my priorities map here, it's this piece, that piece, and that piece. They were all in the same family ownership, but um, three separate parcels, um, not contiguous. Um, so we bought all three of those, uh, 93 acres total to add onto the preserve. Um, but about half of that is uh, uh, arable land. Um, it hasn't been farmed for a couple of years, but um, 
uh, you know, could be put back into production, you know, fairly easily. It's just, you know, growing up in some weeds and, you know, some of this old, old hay field, so there's just clover in there. Not in a terrible state by any means. Um, and so one of the things that we've talked about a bit um, is either um, leasing out those lands to somebody, um, excuse me, or um, since the township um, purchase of that property was entirely with its own funds, that is, we didn't have any county funds or greenbelt funds or anybody else, you know, put money into that one. Um, there is the potential for us. Um, each one of these three parcels has natural features on it, wetlands and woods and whatever. Um, and each of them has, uh, you know, arable land. And so we've had some discussion about, well, maybe we should split off some of the arable land and sell that also in a similar kind of, of a buy, protect, sell process. Another future consideration, um, but something that, we're, that we've uh, talked about, Jacqueline and I have had a number of conversations about doing that kind of thing. So with that, I'm gonna end my presentation and open up for questions. Yeah, Barry, why don't you add just a couple of words on how, <clears throat> how the LPC's efforts play into the sustainability of the uh, township in the future and, you know, the um, viability of beauty and health and so on. So the, the priority uh, uh, criteria um, that produced the, the, the map here um, is based on stuff that's in the, uh, the township ordinance or, and or the, the scoring system that the LPC uses. And that's to protect you know, natural features. I, I should say every, every application that comes in either gets evaluated on a, on a farmland agricultural scoring system or a, on a natural area open space system, depending on what the property uh, uh, has predominantly um, as features. Um, so for natural features, we're looking for stream frontage and wetlands and woods. Um, that's, what, that's what gets a lot of points. Adjacency to other protected lands is another big factor. So that's you know, what that's skewed by, trying to, trying to maintain water quality and wildlife habitat and you know, protecting groundwater resources and, and all that kind of stuff. And on the agricultural side, um, some of those things come into play also, whether you, know, you, get, you get some points if you have woods on the property. But the main focus of that is on USDA prime agricultural soils. Um, and uh, uh, you know, that's, that's you know, what we um, are trying to conserve there primarily. Um, and uh, you know, keeping land uh, in production um, and uh, or putting it back into production in some cases also. Um, and you know, myself and I think Jacqueline as well, and, and I think some other LPC members have, have an interest in trying to push the, the you know, local food production um, through these kinds of easements or purchases of property that we lease out from there. Um, you know, we're you know, close to a, a major metropolitan area um, and not far from another major metropolitan area, Detroit. Um, and so there's great opportunity, I think, for, for you know, a, a great deal more food production and utilizing you know, these public funding sources to drive that process. Thanks, Barry. So questions. Any, any questions about how this works uh, or uh, what the future looks like for land preservation or any, anything of that sort for Barry? So I just wanted to have a, a clarification, Barry. It sounds like you said that you, we've already preserved 13% of the total acreage of the township. Is that correct? Between the, the township's millage and you know, Saginaw Forest and the Metro Parks okay. and you know, those kinds, of, the total amount is, I think I said 2,800 2, acres total, and that's 13% okay. of, the, of the township. And, and are you, you know, one of the goals that are often, you know, put out there is to preserve 30% of a set area. Uh, have you come up with a goal on when you think you might sort of cap this, or do you think the sky's the limit here? you know, in terms of your preservation goal? You know, we haven't set a number per se. Um, the, the one number that we've kicked around is, is the, the number of, of high uh, priority areas, the, the red on the map there. Um, and if you get those, what is that percentage? Um, I think that's another 3,000 acres if I remember correctly, hmm. um, something like that. So that's basically doubling the size. 
and that gets us, you know, to 25% anyway. Um, That's great. Yeah. And, and I just had, you know, how are you communicating your, your um, program? Cause it's absolutely fabulous. So, you know, but how are you getting the word out to what's happening? So we're, you know, whenever we close a project, um, which is, uh, you know, at least once a year, um, we did uh, just the one last year, the, the, the purchase of those three parcels on Park Road. <clears throat> there's an article in the Township Newsletter about that. I think there's some stuff on the, the website as well. I write a press release and submit it to a bunch of uh, local uh, outlets. And we've got really good coverage on those in mean, MLive and the Sun-Times News. Um, you know, and, uh, and it sounds like there's a link on the website where we can get this data, is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, right. go, there's a, a Land Preservation Commission um, uh, button that you can hit on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and lastly, is there is there something that, you know, if you could see the next five years in your wish, wish of wishes, you know, what could the township do to make you even more successful or support you? What are, What's missing? Other than money. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know if I have an answer to that, actually. <laughs> I mean, we have a really solid program. I mean, we need more applications, um, mm -hmm. but that's one of my priorities, you know, for for uh, 22 um, is going. So one of the things that I, I have done on a fairly regular basis is send out letters or make phone calls um, to the uh, high priority landowners in particular, and sometimes uh, other ones as well. Um, and say, hey, you know, have you thought about that program? We're still around. And, you know, uh, and there's a couple of people um, that in the past have said, yeah, I'm gonna do the easement thing and then try to sell my property. Um, and so now we're thinking, well, geez, we have this other means, this buy, protect, sell option, maybe we'll pursue those. So mm -hmm. that's my biggest challenge I think right now is just generating some more applications for the program. Um, and then you know, if we get on the ballot later on this year, um, then y'all voting for us and throwing a few bucks at a campaign committee, I think would be very helpful as well. Thank you. I found my, my uh, list of, of uh, properties, by the way, um, that represent the high priorities there. And it's about 900 acres of open space land and 1800 acres of, of uh, farmland, um, farmland you know, properties. Um, so that's, as I said, 2,700 acres. So it'd be basically twice, you know, what's conserved now gets us to 25% at least. That's just the high priority ones. And there's a bunch more that are, you know, medium, you know. Yeah. And so I, if, we do have... more, if we could create more land in the township, that would be a great thing too. Yeah. And Tim, I don't know if you can see, we have Chris um, who's had his hand up and then Jackie just put her hand up with questions. Yeah. But yeah. Do we want to pull the map off so we've got the people view again? We can do that. Thank you, Barry. Thanks, Barry, for your presentation. Really interesting. It's all new to me. My question is about the property owners of these preserved parcels. Would, are they able to lease their land to DTE, for example, if DTE wanted to install a solar farm on a portion of their land, or is that prohibited? And, and is that idea like the complete antithesis of what you're trying to do here? Great question. So um, when there's a conservation easement on a property, uh, there is, a, uh, especially with the farmland property, um, there is an opportunity for the landowner to install uh, renewable energy um, structures, but only for on-farm use not for sale off the farm. Um, and the uh, installation of you know, solar arrays um, that would cover you know, a good portion of the land are prohibited under conservation easements. Gotcha, thanks you, for answering that. Was there a second question too? Oh, I, like uh, just a more philosophical general question is, you know, taking that land and installing a full, solar farm on it, is that, is that antithesis to the conservation goals that you're striving for? 
that's yeah, that's the way that I see it. I can tell you, um, you know, the uh, arable land, especially uh, high quality agricultural soils, is a limited global resource. And yeah, we need to have solar energy production, but there are other ways to accomplish that. We have lots of rooftops and parking lots and all kinds of things. They do nothing else for us. Um, and uh, I've seen a couple of examples of there being, you know, solar arrays uh, with some cropping in between them. Um, so, you know, there might be some options for that going forward, but, you know, I'd say by and large, we're trying to conserve land resources um, and for a variety of reasons too. It's not just, you know, for agricultural use, it's also for um, uh, wildlife habitat and for groundwater recharge. Um, so, and surface water um, uh, protection, we're not, you know, uh, solar panels are hard surfaces and they probably cause more runoff, um, potentially erosion into waterways. Um, so um, by and large, I think we should site those kinds of facilities elsewhere and not cover our farmland with that. Yep. Sure, makes Any, sense. Thanks for the response. Any others, Jen? Uh, Jackie. Thanks, Jan. Just just a couple quick uh, comments. First of all, Kathy, thanks so much for pointing out about the 30%. I think we're really trying to hold on to that 30% as a great goal for LPC. Certainly, it's a goal that's been stated for Washtenaw County as well as federally. Um, you know, conservationist E.O. Wilson, who recently died, put that goal at 50%. Um, I, I don't know that we could conserve 50% of the land in, in SIO, given our um, our current development and residential and so on, and I'm not sure we'd want to, but but I think the 30% is a it's a good um, goalpost to aim for. Um, just just briefly about our um, preserves for those of you who haven't heard, SIO has been doing a series of Saturdays at SIO hikes on a different preserve every month. Um, so if you would like to explore Sio Woods, which Barry mentioned as it's, it's uh, owned by the county, but, but Sio contributed, um, we're hiking there this Saturday in two days at 10 to 1130. Paths will be icy, so bring your uh, snow and ice gear. Um, I, I dropped into the chat um, another way that we can look at the con the contribution of our natural land to sustainability and sort of climate mitigation and that is there was a wonderful project done for the green belt this past year by a master's student team looking at carbon storage above ground in trees and below ground in soil in the green belt preserves including two of them in SIO and calculating the value. If you look at EPA's current estimated value of car carbon storage at around $50, or maybe it's $49 a ton. Um, and they came, I don't remember the exact figures, but I think for SIO Woods, the value simply for carbon storage is around 858,000. And it, it might be more, again, I haven't looked at those figures recently. So I think as we're really trying to look at our natural lands and look at these other climate change and sustainability values, that's just one single value. That's not groundwater recharge. That's not air purification. That's not flood buffering. That's not any of those other values, not even to mention, of course, the ecological and wildlife habitat values. But it, it, as we're trying to make a strong case for land preservation, I think that's one avenue. And then building on this, um, how we can connect these sort of nature-based climate change solutions with our local conservation efforts. I just wanted to let everybody know that there will be a session at the Stewardship Network Conference, which is online this year on the 28th of January in the afternoon um, between Rosina Bierbaum, former Dean of SNRE and Missy Stoltz and possibly Liesl Clark to really look at how do we take these broad nature-based solution goals that everybody talks about in climate change. And then actually, what does that mean in terms of on the ground land conservation and restoration efforts? So if anybody's interested in that, I can provide the link to that conference. Thanks. Great. Yeah, thank you, Jackie, for that. Um, <clears throat> uh, again, the Land Preservation Committee members value greatly the work that uh, Barry does. He's probably one of the nationally foremost uh, um, 
effective land conservationists. And uh, we're lucky to have them in the uh, working for us in the township. So. Uh, Tim, we just have one, Jane Bogle has her hand up. And uh, maybe we'll make that the last question so that we can move on to um, Jay's talk. Uh, I just uh, completely applaud Barry and just the amazing work he has done in this township. <laughs> The risk of embarrassing the man. Um, I also want to connect three really critical dots, right? Because in my mind, this is just bedrock in our township. And that is all this great work on land preservation, right? LPC, direct connection to the parks group and these six preserves and getting them opened up to our residents to really get folks out there and enjoying them, right? connect to the next dot, which is this transportation alternative planning, the TAP group. It's called that because of a federal bucket of money, but that's the group that's trying to build out this pathway network. And the concept of that network is really built on the same map that Barry shared, the LPC map. How do we connect our residents to these preserves with pathways, the backbone on Z Road, a hoped for commuter corridor and the liberty, a commuter route and the Liberty Corridor, non-motorized, enabling folks to get where they need to go outside of a car. So they're, they're all critical elements of the sustainability puzzle in the township. And it's just the signature of this township to have the land preservation and all of the features of that, including the carbon sink of those tree canopies the parks and preserves, the non-motorized pathways to connect it all together. So I just, I wanted to, to, to make really explicit those connections. Yeah, right. And one last uh, thing for me, Jan, and I'm gonna run to my, uh, my next meeting. Um, I looked at the number of uh, acres in the high, medium and low priority, and that's about 4,600 acres. So if we can serve every last one of those, in addition to what's already been conserved, the 2,800 acres, that's 7,400 acres, that's about 33% of the township. Good. So, Jay, are you still with us? Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Barry. Thank you. Jay, you here? You I'm have here. to take care of your baby? Nope, nope, I've, he, he stopped crying, so we're good for a little while. <laughs> Okay, so just quickly, Jay is highly respected around the county for the work she's done with uh, local farmers and with in the food system and promoting a good, healthy, strong food system for the future. Go for it, Jay. Cool. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Tim. I did not pay Tim to tell me I was one of a. Uh, uh, an asset to the county, but that's great to hear. Thank you. Um, I so I in in not really knowing your group and what you guys do, I'm just going to give you a rundown of me and what I do, and kind of how that relates to um, land preservation, since that seems to be the topic of the night. And then we can go from there, and you guys can ask me questions. Um, so my job is with MSU Extension. Extension is the extending arms of MSU, doing community based work. My, my specific job though, is with the local food system. My goal, my goal is to help local farmers make more transactions in local markets. So I work with a lot of those diversified new and beginning farmers that are selling at Argus, that are selling at Agricole, that are selling at Acorn, that are selling to restaurants that are at the farmer's market. It's the majority of the farmers that I work with, but I also work with some larger farmers who are growing um, who are growing field crops and who are interested in getting into niche grains and other things, um, or who want to transition to organic. So, um, my in in order to do that, in order to help more transactions get made in local markets here, I, I work in a couple ways. One, I do program development for farmers, helping them better their skills with wash pack or food safety or what have you. Um, I also help with networking, so meeting farms, learning from them, what they're doing, and helping connect them to appropriate buyers so that they can grow their markets. 
And third is to create more scale appropriate markets for the farmers that exist already. Um, in the food system, there's this wonderful, huge chasm. It's not wonderful. It's kind of horrible, but it's a chasm between like the, the like small niche direct to consumer markets and these like really large wholesale food coming through on big trucks across the country markets. And so creating more ways for those tiny farmers to scale up and, and help us grow our local food system by giving them more opportunities to grow in a stepwise risk averse way. Um, so that's the quick and dirty. And how this relates to, uh, to kind of the work that you guys are doing in Sio Township is uh, working with kind of land link programs. So um, nationwide, we know we're losing farmland at an alarming rate right? Like the majority of our farmers are at the retirement age. So they're all retiring. Um, the markets in the last decade have been pretty unstable. So even if farmers aren't at retirement age, some are leaving the industry early. Sorry, I'm at hour 13 of my work day today. Um, and then in addition, development is booming, right? So now we have all these people, we have more people in the planet. They, they need houses to live on and they wanna move out into the rural areas. Um, the best way to preserve farmland is to make sure, um, is, is to get new and beginning farmers on the land. Um, when you have a farmer on it, they're gonna take care of the land. They're gonna be, they're gonna be adding amendments to the soil. They're gonna be thinking about drainage because they don't want their, their, their soil to run off. They are gonna be thinking about the invasive species. They don't want the invasive species to take over. They're gonna be thinking about noxious weeds. So it's a really great way to kind of preserve farmland and preserve your natural resources is to have more of these types of farmers farming on the land. Um, the number one challenge though, that those farmers face is cost and simply knowing about it. It seems kind of silly, but the way that rural land is transferred a lot of the time especially in our larger farms, is neighbors buying up other neighbors' properties. So it's kind of like this under, under the table thing. You don't drive out in the rural area and see a lot of like Remax signs about land available. Um, there's a lot of transactions that happen under the radar or um, farmers, you know, uh, put, uh, succeeding their farms to um, employees or family members or who have you. So cost and knowing about it, two big challenges. Um, the land preservation programs that, that uh, Barry just talked about are a great way to help with the cost. This is total ballpark, but we're talking like 10,000 an acre down to 3,000 an acre when you sell the conservation easement. That makes that farmland much more affordable for a new and beginning farmer. Um, what, what farmland preservation doesn't do and is not meant to do, but it just doesn't do is help spread the word about what farmland is available. And so that's where this land link program comes in. Land link programs exist all over the country. They exist a lot in Canada too. And we just don't have a really good one here in Michigan. Um, Traverse City tried to start one. Uh, it, um, I think the, the or organic organization in Michigan tried to start one. And they, they list farmland that's available, but you can, you can list farmland, but if you don't have the people getting that word out there and spreading the words so that folks know to go to those sites to find farmland, it just kind of dies on the internet. Um, so there's this really active group in Washtenaw County right now who's working with folks in, I think it's Berrien County. It's like way over here near Chicago. Um, to create a statewide farm link program, which would ideally be very robust and which would list properties that new and beginning farmers could, uh, uh, could, could purchase to start their farms. And that this would all be kind of combined with our um, conservation programs, especially here, because ours are so um, special. We have what, six out of the nine, is that what Barry said? Um, and so, so trying to help make all of those connections meet in, the, in, in one place that's easy to access for a new beginning farmer. Um, so so that's, that's that initiative that we're doing right now. 
Um, I guess I'll just pause there and take any questions. I know Janine had a question um, about racial equity as it pertains to all of this. So I'm happy to answer that. Um, but let me just pause right now and just see what kind of questions you guys have. Hey, Jay, I have another question. This is Janine. Hi, Janine. Um, hi there. So, so grateful for the work you and others are doing um, in, this, in this food system space. Um, I am curious, as, as uh, Celeste was asking about goal setting for land preservation, I know I've, I've been connected to some um, goal setting work that folks were doing, it seemed like mostly for the city of Ann Arbor, maybe for Washtenaw County, about like, like, do we have goal setting for the how much food we're hoping local farmers, you know, can produce oh. in our county mm -hmm. or in our township? And I'm curious um, what folks thinking is on that and how we might include any of that in our sustainability planning for the township. Yeah, for a long time, there was this 20% by 2020. It sounded so great, 20% by 2020. Um, we, that was a statewide initiative. We definitely adopted it here in Washtenaw County. Um, no one has done, no one has like run the numbers and like figured out what is our, and it's, I, I don't know how to do that as a researcher. That's not my area of expertise, but I would love for someone to give us a report card of like, where are we? with this goal um, of how much local food we're transacting, I'll tell you that at the time that the 20% by 2020 thing came out, which was about 2010, we, someone did run the numbers and we were at like less than 2% of our food consumed in Washtenaw County was produced locally. Since that time, I mean, Argus has totally changed the game. The, there's, the CSAs have, you know, grown exponentially, um, tons of new markets. So I have to say it's, I, I would guess it's definitely over five at this point. Um, but I don't, I don't know the actual numbers for sure. Uh, there is a Michigan Good Food Charter, which is putting out another one of those goals. And I think it's, it's something by 2030, and I'm not sure what number they're going to come up with. <laughs> but uh, 30% by 2030 would be a really, really hard goal. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I've been hearing. That'd be a big yeah. goal, 30%. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Celeste has a hand up. Celeste, you might be on. Yeah, just got it. Um, I wanted to ask about food affordability. We've done some discussion about, yes, it's good to have this local support of locally grown food, but what's being done about, um, you know, trying to figure out a way to change the market so the food is more affordable? Are there connections to people with food deserts or low income programs or food subsidies? Have you, have you looked at any of that? And, and is that something that's there in the future? Yeah, this is a great question. And there's two ways to think about it. One way is to is to try to get people who are on SNAP and other um, uh, benefit programs access to this food. And I think the people who are doing that the best in our county is the farm at St. Joe's. They have received a lot of grant money to build up the infrastructure and the programming for which to funnel food to those to low income folks. Um, in a very, very subsidized way so that they're getting a lot of fresh vegetables for very little money, if any, and are able to use their SNAP benefits in order to pay for some of that. Um, so they're, they're really pushing the envelope and, and making it happen on that end. And they're working very closely with food gatherers and with Jewish family services in order to do that. Um, but the other way to think about it is, is that like food is underpriced right now in general. And so when farmers, when local farmers price their food, they're, a lot of them, if they're, if they're smart, <laughs> not if they're smart, if they're using enterprise budgets and really thinking of the numbers and pricing that food so that it makes sense with their production costs, it's gonna cost a lot more because the, the big food companies are able to subsidize our food costs. Um, they're able to do that with tax dollars. Um, 
and they're able to do that with scale of economy. And so our little folks just can't compete on that level. And so it is more expensive. Um, we live in an area where, I mean, bless, bless some, some people's hearts, but they'll buy food for more money than, than it usually would in any other market. And so our farmers are able to survive and thrive and keep their businesses going. So it's kind of this double-edged sword. And thankfully in our area, we have, we have both being pushed right now. We have food being more, being literally made more accessible because it's funded by like hospital dollars and these other grants. Um, and then we, at the same time, we also have markets being developed for farmers to sell their food at the cost that they need to um, so that they can keep staying in business. Does that make sense? And then I can also answer Janine's question that she had in the chat about racial equity. Um, and are we encouraging farmers of color to apply for these programs? Um, there is a, a fantastic group right now. Um, I'm honored to be a part of it, Washtenaw County Black Farmers Fund. The, we heard from a lot of black farmers um, kind of right after the pandemic, uh, the Washtenaw Food Policy Council did a bit of a survey and um, Growing Hope, which is a garden-based organization, Ypsilanti did uh, a webinar with, with black farmers of Washtenaw County, kind of getting their perspective. And what we heard was we don't have access to capital. Like all you white folks have intergenerational wealth and, and we just don't have that. And so like, we can't even put the down payment down for a piece of land. Um, what are we gonna do? And so this group kind of ad hoc came together and said, let's raise money to help these black farmers buy equipment, uh, get, a, get a down payment down on, a, on some land pay for their operating costs for a year, like whatever it may be. Um, we were able to raise $100,000 and we are now in the, like distributing the application. We'll be reviewing those applications and hopefully distributing funds starting in March. Um, there's a lot more complication than that, but that's the quick and dirty. And uh, yeah, we're hoping to, to be able to like lift up eight to 10 farmers in that way, um, just by getting more cash into um, into their hands. They have, what I've heard from a lot of the black farmers is in addition to not like, in addition to the cash issue is also there's a, there's a culture issue in our rural areas. And so like not feeling comfortable buying land in rural areas, wanting to buy land in their communities, which right now are in rural or in urban areas. Um, and so trying, we're also like thinking, how do we create an ecosystem of black farmers that are supporting each other in the way that it, it's happening right now in rural America um, amongst white farmers, just because there's, there's a lot of them and there's a lot of support and they're all like meeting each other at the auction and, um, and at the stockyard weekly and at the, at the local store where they buy their inputs. Um, so how do we create a culture of that uh, um, or help foster that. I'm, I'm not a part of that community, obviously, um, but I'm just here to support the creation of, of, of that um, and help in, in whatever I can. Good, any more questions for Jay? Jay, I have a question for you. Tim and I are trying to compile a list of locally for <laughs> sourced um, f food venues for SIO residents. And, um, you know, we have a couple lists and we were trying to figure out how we can put that on a website. Um, I was going to see if we could get a GIS person to maybe even doing a map, you know, with little icons of, you know, whether it's a farm stand or a CSA or both, or, you know, is anybody working on something like that? Yeah, so Taste the Local Difference it has has like the best map that that the best map that I've seen. Um, the challenge with some of these things is uh, is like give permission. So especially when you're listing farms, getting the farms permission to list it on a site. But they've been right at that for for a long time. So they have maps, um, and you can filter them and draw radiuses. And so I'll send you the link to that. 
um, because that would be a great resource. That'd be great rather than trying to do something on our own. So that that's super. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get to that. And it's, you're right, Jay, it's not 100%. um, I I don't know if I'd even put it at 75% inclusive of all Mm -hmm. the resources available in the uh, county, let's say, Um, certainly for the township. So uh, um, maybe we can add to it, Jan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, or just say go here and then here are some that aren't represented there or something like that. If we know of some mm-hmm. that would want to be posted. So yeah. Well, and if you do take that hybrid approach, I'm happy to look at a list and add in anything that I know of. And taste the local difference. Um, yep. Don't you say a word about that, Jay. Yeah, Janine just what put is- the link in the chat. Um, taste the local difference is a local food marketing company. They're located up in Traverse City, but they operate statewide. Um, they, their whole goal is to like spread the word about local food, essentially. And so they have a cat, they have a catalog that they release um, once a year, and they do some other like marketing events for farmers. Farmers get get to be marketed in their materials for free, and then um, uh, and then other like companies like uh, Argus would, I, would would pay a small fee. Um, restaurants would pay a fee, that kind of thing. So they're just trying to spread the word about local food um, and provide resources to make it easier for people to get local food. Right, and there's a website for Taste the Local Difference. Anybody could look it up anytime you want to. Mm-hmm. And it's got that map on it that Jay referred to. Yeah. Great, thanks oh, for the oh. links too, Janine. Yeah, what's Washington on Markets? Floating very slow. Yeah, it's apparently uh, a list of the farmers markets in our area, plus uh, the community supported agriculture. So again, probably not inclusive of some of the newer farms or maybe some of the smaller farms and probably not many of the black owned farms. But uh, yeah, it's a, I think it's a good, good starting point. That's great. Okay. Jay, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, probably you want to move on, Jen. We do. Yeah. So our um, thank you, everyone. I mean, those were it was great to spend that time and and learn so much. So thank you both, um, Jay. And I think uh, Barry had to leave. So um, I'll just open it up right now for any public comment. Um, We do have a public comment period now and then after our uh, sort of report out and framework. And if you wanted to raise your hands, if anyone joining us from the public wants to make a comment, you can also put it in chat. (laughs) That works too. Okay. Seeing none at this point, then um, uh, uh, I was wondering if uh, we could switch um, sort of the report out and the framework. Um, We're almost at 8.30 and I sort of really want to get to the framework piece um, and maybe what we can do is just have the groups um, email um, a, you know, their updates um, to uh, Kathy and we can, we can publish those with the minutes. Um, it just because, uh, you know, we, last time we didn't, we got late and we didn't get to the, you know, a real good framework discussion. Does anyone object to switching, switching that? No objection. Um, Okay. All right, great. Then uh, we'll go ahead and and jump to that. Um, I sent out uh, two documents and I sort of wanted to, um, one was the ES uh, kind of a environmental sustainability framework document and then a work group outline. And they're really, one is just the simplified version of the other. And the intent is the work group outline would be what each of the different working groups can take and start, um, you know, working on some of their recommendations, documenting um, uh, their resources and so forth. So what I'm going to do, um, and big picture is, I don't think we're not writing, if you would, if you could call it this, a climate action plan as much as I want to call it a playbook because we still have like a public engagement piece, um, but there may be some key 
recommendations that we want to make, like, you know, we were talking about um, aligning a carbon neutrality goal with Washtenaw County. We were talking about creating a land preservation goal, oh, all right, of, of 30%. You know, do we, you know, you can recommend, you know, a, um, um, a, a local food sourcing goal or, you know, things like that, um, that we really want to get feedback on and we want to make sure that um, we're including all the components and things. So the idea is that what we're doing is we're creating more of a playbook that might have some strategies that have references, you know, represents the work that all the working groups have done. And what I'd like to do is have those, you know, have a draft of each working group's document by the end of March for us to kind of share and go through. And, um, and then so we can start to kind of pull that together into a document then that can go to the planning commission, you know, can be shared with the trustees and can be um, sort of these are the next steps we think we need to do. You know, we have some goals to set. We may need to, we may have more questions we need. We, you know, do we need to do a greenhouse gas inventory? All those kinds of things. Um, and there may be some policies, you know, like um, encourage the planning commission, hey, you know, adapt an EV charging ordinance, start working on some of those things. So there can be some things where we need to do more. There are some things that we need to uh, recommend about public outreach. We, there are some things that um, uh, we can go ahead and start doing, you know, like, um, you know, they decided to do solar on the fire station. So it's, you know, I don't see it as, I see it as an evolving document and I see it as a guidance document. Um, and a represent a representation of the work that um, everyone's been doing. Um, and that way, we also have a document that the students who are going to be building, you know, an outreach and education program can use to build upon as well. So um, what I want to do first is just um, going to as I lose half my screen here. Um, I wanna share the, the work group outline because that's um, sort of the easier piece and can, okay, can people see that? Okay. So the intent here is, you know, you'd have your area title, um, the first section, why is it important? And then we looked at some considerations, those lenses that we wanted to look at. You know, so what are some of the issues around climate change, equity, health and wellness, circular economy, um, economic development and viability, and community outreach? So that's just looking at those kind of those lenses that we did um, earlier and how does it, how, you know, what sort of, uh, it, I'm, I'm just trying to give an example. Um, the, it, it, the circular economy, um, it, with buildings, there's a lot of construction and demolition waste. There's also embodied carbon. So, you, you know, in, in the more um, you don't use resources just once and throw them away, the more it can build into more of a circular economy, for example. Um, so that's sort of like a, a summary of your area, why it's important and the considerations that we're taking into account. And then um, some goals, recommendations, or maybe even getting into strategies. But I see us more in the goals and the recommendations or recommended goals. And for each of those sort of, you know, what, what you're recommending, why, um, is this something that's a long-term thing, a short-term thing? Is it a foundational thing? Um, the references, you know, where have you done your research? You know, so we capture that and don't lose the references that people are using. Um, who would be possible uh, enablers or partners in, in this goal or recommendation? Um, metrics, 
how would we measure our progress toward this goal? And then the resources we need, you know, whether it's staffing, funding, um, uh, more expertise, whatever that might be. So I, those are the things, and not all of them may be, um, you know, there might be um, some things that aren't totally applicable to some of those goals and recommendations, but it's, it's something to get everyone um, kind of writing the same way. Um, and so I wanted to get some feedback on that. And then the, the framework um, piece in, includes this, but I started th like this because this is what everyone can pick up and kind of write with. Um, and then I want to, let me just open up the, <clears throat> the framework document. And this includes sort of some sort of preamble about, you know, who we were, how we started, um, talking about um, uh, the, um, you know, mission, vision, values that we kind of landed on, the key principles, um, thinking that we should do some sort of summary um, table for what um, the key the key recommendations or goals and the key enablers or um, constituent groups we have um, and maybe some key resources. Um, and then I, just as an example, I started filling out some of that um, uh, worksheet for energy and buildings. So sort of like a statement about why it's important, um, you know, some statistics, some climate change considerations, equity considerations, health and wellness. Um, so I wanted to, you know, kind of start it as an example because obviously, if you if you test it, it it sometimes helps. I didn't get all the way through it, so I wanted to. With that, I wanted to kind of open it up. Um, if people have your computers, and I can keep sharing it, although it's it's kind of hard to read and, and discuss it at the same time, but I wanted to get some feedback on that and to think if, are things missing? Is it too complicated? Um, sort of what people think about um, using that as a, a format for what we're doing. So yes, I have a question, Jan. Yes. On the uh, document that you're looking at right now on the chart section up above, yeah. Would, would you like the groups to literally use to start plugging that information into this document? Um, I don't think you need to do it, the chart yet. I think in okay. my mind, you know, a brainstorming some of your, you know, from your resources and so forth, some of the recommendations that you have and, and, and so forth. Um, if people want an example, I think I sent out the, um, it's a climate action plan, so it goes much further than we really can go at this point um, that I think um, Celeste uh, group found, which was the um, uh, Bloomington, Indiana um, um, climate action plan, which uses a little bit of this format. It doesn't have you know, sort of the, the references and some of the resources needed, because we're trying to create more of a, um, a, a document that, um, that will evolve. You know, they had a, they had um, a, a large, this is the beginning of our process. The climate action plan was sort of the end of their climate action process. And I'm sort of seeing if we can make it, you know, by spring, you know, uh, kind of reach some of consensus and some of these goals and the areas that we think are critical, it'll give structure then to um, uh, the community outreach and uh, engagement plan. And, you know, obviously we're gonna get feedback from people on, on, on what we um, have put together and we'll, you know, incorporate that feedback and so forth into more of a formal um, climate action plan is kind of what we're thinking at this point. And I see Celeste, you have your hand up. 
I uh, took a stab at uh, filling out the outline, Jan, and I think it worked pretty well. I still have a lot of questions about filling in a lot of the blanks. I mean, there's no time to really put in references, for example, that are really substantial. Um, it's just, you know, beyond kind of the scope of, of what mm -hmm. we can do now and some of the data. So I, I ended up, you know, sort of identifying things that I needed as we talked about rather than filling in the blanks. And, and I, I think that's a great, I think that's a great option. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's a good way to start getting us all on the same page. And, um, you know, and I think once we all get a draft going, then we might have more clarity. I really would like to have a session where it's just us and not uh, a speaker, because I, I would like us to really have more time to compare in a bit more depth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what we're doing. Yeah, I, I think that is a good suggestion. And I think um, materials and waste have their, um, I think at the, oh, I'm sorry, uh, transportation and mobility, right? Have February, is that correct? Or is it materials and waste? Materials and waste. It, it's materials and waste, okay. Are you gonna have yes. one speaker or two? I'm, ask me that again. Uh, were you going to have one speaker or two? Oh, it's one. Because I'm wondering if there's a way that um, transportation and mobility or one of the other groups could, we could double up the speakers and then that would give us all of April to really work on, you know, everybody would have their, if we all get our kind of a, the, the drafts and our brainstorming done and so forth, it would give us all of April's meeting to then, um, focus on um, recommendations and goals and things like that. A you know, we could do April's meeting and then May's meeting, both of those. To I wonder if that's process. too late. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want to give, you know, the groups time too, or we could, you know, schedule some additional meetings. I mean, that's the other way to do it or, um, unless people don't want to do the speakers, but I'm learning so much from the people that are presenting too. Thoughts? Jan, is your thought to double up next month and, and then when March be open? Um, well, we still have, let's see. Um, well, we have, February, March, and April, unless we tried to do three presentations next month, but that's kind of hard. That's a lot of an ad. Yeah. Especially for the evening. Yeah, that is. Okay. Well, Jan, do we have to have everybody present before we hold a working meeting on this framework? Okay. Yeah. We could, we could yeah. skip a month, I right? Think I think what we want to make sure is people at least have a good start on their recommendations and goals and have tested the framework. Um, so part of that is in your in the working groups, how much time do you need to get enough work done? Um, you know, um, so we have something to share. That's the the balance part. I mean, if you, if we, you know, I was thinking the end of March, you know, gives you, um, you know, again, January, February gives you maybe three meetings or so to put that together. Jane, you raised your hand. Again, do we want, are we done with the document? Uh, just a question to come back among us. Um, all right, here's my thought that I think this work is gonna be highly iterative. And I think this, 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 this language of playbook really appeals to me. We're not, we're not looking for anything close to a final product. We, it's almost like it's a framework and outline. It doesn't want to be lots of pages and a lot of density. I think we are pulling ideas together. I think sooner than later, we want to get them in front of each other to just go through an iteration of thinking and betting. Um, because I really think this is going to iterate over time. And even to say by May to have a playbook done, it's simply the first iteration of something. Mm -hmm. So one consideration, like I've really enjoyed these presentations and 
maybe we just tighten them up. We say, okay, we're gonna do one or two presentations. It's 15 minutes each, hit the highlights. And then we pick one or two work groups and give them an opportunity to share their thinking, provide some feedback, support another iteration of, of work on that particular proposal. So then the agenda really becomes more of a working session. You're, you're hearing one, maybe two time-bounded presentations. You're hearing one, maybe two work groups. And you just lay out a schedule for February, March, April, get everybody through at least once. So coming into May, you're ready to start maybe piecing something together. Just a thought. Yeah. Thoughts on that? Just maybe stick with one presentation and then I have a, a couple of work groups, focus on a couple of work groups. Does that, how does that sound? You know, really, I just assume have the talks after we do our drafts. You know, it's nice to get this additional information, but it's, it's more information than I need right now. I, what I need is more process input. Mm -hmm. And, and I think once we get how people are pulling their drafts together, then we can have a conversation about what kind of sharing we want to do and then do that sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I would, since we already have someone scheduled for February, we can just do the one and then go ahead and, and spend the most the rest of the time on process P. And, um, and if people have just some basic um, you know, thoughts down on paper that they wanna share, do you think we could do a, a rapid all share or do you wanna focus on a couple of groups at a time? Can you send things in ahead of time to the group, you know, by email mm -hmm. and when we get them available? That would be helpful because people could look at them prior to. I think I would rather focus on one or two groups at a time because I feel like if I got everyone's thrown at me at once and then we're trying to talk about all of them at once, I would not be able to focus well. <laughs> okay, I have, I have two people then, yeah, really talking about this. So, uh, Jeff. Yeah, one thing we could do perhaps is circulate everybody's draft so we could all have a look at them and then we focus on a couple each meeting. But we still have the whole set that we could review and, mm -hmm. and just work on, you know, take inspiration from in private. Okay, I see a couple thumbs up. <laughs> okay, then what will, let's do this. Um, everyone has access to the Google Drive, right? So I will, I will start a folder called um, Playbook. And in that folder will be um, the sort of blank, the, that worksheet, the, um, what did I call it? The, the work group um, kind of template. And everybody can take that and label it for your work group and do your work in that. Is that does that work for people? And that way it's all there. People can go in at their leisure and look at it. And then um, let's say if we're gonna meet um, I'm just going to look at February here. Um, uh, February 3rd, um, what if we had it, um, then I can e I'll email out what we have in there that Monday, um, the January 31st. So that means everybody has to meet between now and January 31st and work on at least, you know, brainstorming, you know, your recommendations and, um, you know, some categories. I don't think, I'm not expecting people to, you know, fill out the whole thing, but at least 
get those thoughts on where you think you're at, what are the core issues and, and recommendations or goals um, that, that you want to see put out there. Does that make sense? Sounds good. Okay. And then um, um, I don't know what if there are a couple groups that want to volunteer then to um, be the the deeper dive in the discussion piece um, for, for that time. Maybe we can get through two or three. Um, and then we'll do the same thing. It'll be the Monday before um, for the March meeting. You know, people can add to and, um, you know, get, for, get further along and then we'll give feedback to the other two or three groups um, for the March meeting. And if people just continue to add, and I think the further along we get in, you know, using the template, we can also refine the template too. And if people have suggestions for what to include or what not to include, or, you know, simplifying it, um, we, we keep on moving in that direction. That sound good? I feel, I feel better about that. It's, it's been, <laughs> you know, process is always a struggle, isn't it? Because it, <laughs> feel like we I have also, some traction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I also want to just test another thing. Are are folks good with a two hour meeting? It it gets late as it approaches nine o'clock. Do we want to stay with a two hour format? Do we want to consider an hour and a half with a with a tight focused? I I don't know. I I, I realize I'm tired. I'm sure that may be shared. I just feel like going into the new year. Is that a question we want to just consider briefly? Yeah. Um, I think two hours is too long. Mm -hmm. Hour and a half in the evening, I think, is enough. And we should just set it at that and we get done. What we get done, there's no big rush to get, you know, um, a whole lot accomplished. We can do this over time, but. I think uh, two hours is too long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think everybody kind of runs out of steam. I do. I do. Yeah, I, I really think the 90 minute format and it keeps us focused and and getting some good work done and, and then saying good night. Yep. OK, that sounds good. Um, we will do that. And I just want to um, then moving along, then I will go ahead and set that up. Uh, remind people, I'll, I'll send a link, you know, so you have a, um, for folks that aren't too great with Google, send a, a link to that um, folder. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, because <laughs> I know I always, you know, sometimes you get lost in the Google Drive, right? Um, then uh, I want to just say, I don't know if there's anyone public um, have any comments Hey, Jan, will you just pull the document down, please? Oh, do I? Am I still sharing? Sorry. Okay. My whole. Oh, there we go. Sorry. My control was hidden. Oh, just us chickens. Okay. <laughs> Appreciate that, Jeff. Um, then um, minutes, um, did anyone take a look at the minutes? Any? Yes, they look good to me. Mm, yes. I Consider agree. that a motion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moved by Charlie <laughs> and supported by Tim um, to approve the minutes as written of the uh, December meeting. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. Um, any other announcements? Okay, well, then we'll just have one speaker next time and um, then dive into our work. Okay, uh, move to adjourn. So I move. I move. Second. <laughs> and and third. seconded and thirded. <laughs> All those in favor? Hi. 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 Happy New Year and yeah. Thank you. Good, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks so much.
Good night. Thanks for all your attention to this, Jen. Oh, thank you, Tim. I really appreciate you getting good, great speakers. Good night. Good night. Okay, good night.